Um, thank you all for uh, showing up. Um, I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker, Meg uh, Schramm. Uh, she's a lecturer at the Astrophysics Research Center at the School of Mathematics and Physics at the Queen's University in Belfast in the UK. Um, her research is centered on planetary sciences, search and characterization of new planets, uh, trans-Neptunian objects uh, with more than 60 peer review publications. Uh, she studied physics at the University in Pennsylvania. And then she went uh, for, uh, to Caltech for her master and PhD uh, studies under the supervision of Michael Brown. Uh, from between 2010 and 2013, she was a postdoc at Yale University. And then from 2013 to 2016, she was a postdoc at the Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics of Academia Sinica in Taipei, where we met with Sunda. Uh, from 2016 to 2019, she held the position of assistant scientist at the Gemini Observatory in Hawaii. Um, she has been involved in a large number of outreach activities, engaging hundreds of thousands of people in planetary science research through different projects, such as the souvenirs, uh, which includes the identification of planet transits in the Kepler data from NASA, as well as mapping the location of sizes of surface uh, features of the Martian cell pole produced by carbon dioxide jets. Um, she's also one of the co-founders of the Astronomy on Tap. You might know this is this is a series of public astronomy lectures, series of uh, short talks by astronomers in local bars, which I pretty much like. Um, as her vast uh, dedication of, to the public she, in 2017, she was awarded with the Carl Sagan Medal for Excellence in Public Communication in Planetary Sciences Science Award by the American, American Astronomical Society. So then again, thank you, Meg, for uh, being here and talking about your work. Uh, we are very happy to have you, and please. Uh, she will be talking about exploring Mars with uh, 150,000 earnings. So thank you, Meg. Thanks. Thanks, I'm glad to be here, thank you. Okay, and I think you can see the slide, perfect. Can everybody see the next slide? Hopefully it's advancing. Yes. Uh, perfect. So if you should be seeing, hopefully, uh, the Mars Curiosity rover. Hopefully you're seeing that. Yes. Um, awesome, you never know with Zoom and Blue Jeans and all the other things and Teams, they always somehow keep me on my first slide and never go further. But why I have uh, an emo rover that takes selfies um, on my slide is because I really want to talk about Mars in sort of a different context than why we mostly send rovers to, to Mars. We tend to send rovers to Mars and to figure out how Earth-like Mars is. But a lot of what I'm, I'm working on is figuring out um, how Mars is different than Earth. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about um, the Planet 4 projects that we're using to study the Martian South Pole and its seasonal processes and how it's different um, than the Earth. And you know, my title slide, I'm talking about 150,000 Earthlings. I really mean I have 150,000 uh, collaborators that are working um, on this uh, project. Okay. Um, and so here, um, I just wanna highlight that one of the key differences between the Earth and Mars is um, in terms of atmosphere composition, um, and its properties. So Earth has a much th uh, much thinner atmosphere than, uh, rather Mars has a much thinner atmosphere compared to the Earth. Um, both planets have polar caps, but Mars is actually made from uh, carbon dioxide ice. And about 30% by mass of the atmosphere condenses down onto the winter pole each year. And then as that winter pole gets in the sunlight, that carbon dioxide ice sublimates and go straight from solid to gas into the atmosphere um, and then con condenses back down on the, the new winter pole. Um, and so you have this huge shifts in pressure and amount of atmospheric material um, uh, in the polar regions. Uh, and so this is not anything like we have on Earth. And so this does have significant impact um, to climate. Um, and so what we see on the South Pole if in uh, of Mars is that on that seasonal cap, so about a meter thick um, 
semi-translucent sheet of carbon dioxide is deposited every winter and starts sublimating in southern spring. And what we see is one with sunlight has returned to the South Pole um, on that seasonal ice sheet. And I think you can see my mouse, you see these sort of dark streaks um, and blotches sort of dotting the surface. And so this is a high resolution color image from the South Pole um, taken in, in the early spring. And what do we think is happening? We think we're actually seeing the signs of carbon dioxide jets, geysers going off on the South Pole. So this is an artist rendition. I wouldn't definitely want to be standing on this, but what the, they're thinking is, is that each one of these vents, these sort of, you know, start points and then streaks or these fans or these sort of blotch like things is really what we're seeing is again, um, having basically um, the carbon dioxide jet, uh, gas that's trapped from the sublimating um, ice sheet come up out of, the, to, out of any kind of break in the ice sheet with dust and dirt and goes up maybe up to two stories, but not much further. And so that you, if you were standing here, you'd be hearing all the ice cracking as this, and at the whooshes from all this material coming out. Okay, so how does that work in practice? So what we think is happening that in the spring, when you image, you sort of see, um, you know, there's maybe a few fans. And again, the schematic down here is probably a little bit easier to understand is that you have this semi-translucent chunk of ice, and that has come from the atmosphere and collapsed and condensed down. But that's not a pure slab of carbon dioxide ice. It has the atmospheric dust in it. Mars is the red planet, it's dusty. That there, as things sublimate and back to the atmosphere, right, it has gotten dust in it. Um, and so when it condenses down and freezes or snows down in the, you know, in the winter, that atmospheric dust is trapped within that seasonal sheet. And you can think of it like a frosted piece of glass, right? Um, and the, the idea here is that um, as this, uh, you know, you, this ice sheet um, gets exposed to the sun, right? It's semi-translucent. You'll start heating the soil and then that's gonna start basically sublimating the base of your ice sheet. And so now you have a trapped layer of gas in this, uh, you know, above this frosted ice sheet, um, right? This sort of piece of glass and that in any way this pressure tries to break out. And as it does, it captures dust and dirt from below and brings it up creating the jets. Um, and that the wind is blowing this material into these seasonal fans, creating these st streaks. Um, and so the idea being is that we think that when you go from spring all the way to summer and here there's no ice left. So in these two images here on the left, there's uh, the ice sheet there. So we're sort of looking through that frost of glass and that when that ice sheet is gone, the fans disappear. And so the only way we think that happens is again, that the material that came up, right, is on top of something that's got a little bit of opacity because of that atmospheric dust. Um, and the quantity of that atmospheric dust depends on how dusty Mars's atmosphere is, depending on the amount of dust storms, whether there was a global dust storm on Mars. Um, and so linked in this process is actually elements of Mars's global climate. Um, and so if we could one, count up all the fans, we'd have some interesting things to think about in terms of at, just thinking about what's going on in this dust sheet and how that impacts the sublimation process and the number of jets you get. But also, right, really these fans are being produced by the local wind direction. Um, and so this could be a really powered data set if you had all these little wind socks you could measure. And just to give you some sense for this, this is the Kelso Dunes um, in California, in the US, and taking a slab of carbon dioxide ice and putting it down. Um, just to show you that it really can whip up and move a lot of material as it's sublimating. Now, granted, this is earth pressure, but it gives you the sense, right? You can see at the edges, it's moving stuff. It's moving those particulates around. Um, and you might ask, how do we do wind measurements on Mars? And so basically you either look at pressures. And so this is Viking, just showing you that huge shifts in pressure due to the atmosphere condensing down onto the winter pole and then sublimating back by looking at clouds and their motion, plumb bobs. <laughs> so actually making your own sort of, you know, mass with a string and seeing where, where it's blowing. Um, same thing, sort of plumb bob, anemometer kind of measurements. So in situ measurements, right? We've sent probes down. You can sound from, do atmospheric sounding from some spacecraft, but really to get to the surface, you've gotta be on it. And why is the surface interesting? That's a big boundary when you have a fluid, you know, an atmospheric fluid, right? Um, and so the atmosphere interacting with the, with the surface is always a tricky boundary condition. Um, 
And so if we can measure all these wind socks, we create the largest wind map on, on the surface of Mars to date. Um, but there's hundreds and thousands of these fans in the images. And on top of that, not all of them are individual fans. And just to show you why we still think that this is wind, um, these are two images taken from Mars surface. It's just two sub images. And what you see is here, there's all these little, in this image, there's all these little like ellipses. We call them blotches informally. And the idea in this model is we think that it's just the wind directions coming up or rather the material coming up, but there's no wind and then the, the, the material just falling around the vent. And that with the fans, right, it really is wind direction. Here you can all kind of see that the fans have multiple directions, they bifurcate, but they still have the same starting point. And we really do think that this is telling us that the wind direction has changed. And so we really think is that by measuring all these fans and there's hundreds of thousands of them in, in an individual high resolution image, we could get these incredible maps of the surface of Mars. Okay, that's lovely, but what kind of data set do we have to do this? Well, sort of lucky in timing in some sense that around 2007, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter arrived just before a big uh, global dust storm on Mars. So a big event um, within the Martian atmosphere. And it's been running since that point. And Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has on it the highest resolution camera we've ever sent to another planet called HiRISE. And HiRISE has been monitoring as part of its, its uh, campaigns, uh, the, many of these regions on the South Pole looking for these um, carbon dioxide jets and fans and to see how they, they evolve. And so all the images I'm showing you are coming from right now have come from high rise. Um, and so here's just showing you two high rise images. High rise can do color. It also can do single filter. So here's a single filter. So that's why it's not and we're not looking like red. But these are two different year, two different seasons on, on, on Mars. So two different years is what we call it. Seasons by seasonal campaigns by high rise. And this is roughly the same area. Um, and so it looks like there is some kind of hill here. Um, and what you're seeing here, right, is that you're seeing these um, these fans here. And these are roughly the same same times of the of of the the spring season. So, but you might ask, there's clearly it seems to be differences in the amount of fans. Like Season two tends to have a lot more. You can just see that this area looks more visit co colored within here. Um, and so what we think is actually happening, right, is something to do with the climate. And what happened between season one and season two is that uh, right about the time that season one was imaged, shortly after, uh, Mars entered this global dust storm. And so while the seasonal ice cap that season two's geysers or jets are coming from, there was way more there was way more dust in the atmosphere that got dumped into this ice sheet. And so something about there being more, more dust may be driving the activity here and why we see more fans. But by looking at it by eye is not enough. So if we could measure the sizes, shapes, and directions of the fans, we can get wind directions, we can look at how the process of carbon dioxide going back into the atmosphere changes as we change the climate and even maybe able to probe and understand how Mars' atmosphere responds to dust storms, right? How long does it take us to go from anything that looks like season two to go back to looking like season one when we know that there wasn't a dust storm? And so what, there's a lot of, I think, rich information in here that can, we can look at to explore more about how Mars is so different than Earth. Um, and that's over different Mars years, but we can also look within a, within a single spring summer season on Mars, right? And so this is just showing one area, roughly the same positions. Um, and this is in color from high rise and just looking at how the seasonal processes evolve, right? How we get all these fans and blotches and how and when they emerge and, and their properties, right? And so again, that there's more information involved in this and just learning about the climate, right? And understanding how the surface darkens or the surface of this ice sheet darkens, how that drives this problem, uh, how it drives the sublimation of this carbon dioxide ice. Because all of these, this image here has that seasonal ice cap, that semi-translucent ice cap on top of it, right? Um, and these fans are sitting on top of it again, and that we're looking through, see, we're seeing the fans, looking through the ice and seeing the surface. 
Um, and so you're, you've, I've now hopefully sold you that cool to study Mars in weird new ways, we could be looking at, um, should be looking at these seasonal processes. Okay, so why is a machine doing this? And why, why is this a whole talk about having 150,000 collaborators? Because this is not an easy problem. Um, and so I am showing you in a snapshot of the different sub-images from high rise for the South Pole. And so like Earth or like people, um, right? They're all different. There's a lot of different textures and colors and this makes it a hard problem. And I sort of glossed over this, but in some of these images, you might see these sort of wiggly channels. Um, I'll get to them later, but I'll just say that right now, those are things we dub and call spiders or araneiforms. We think they are carved slowly over eons by the carbon dioxide jets. And so we see spiders or araneiforms, we think that there usually is, tends to be, when we look in the images, that you see the, this fan activity. Um, so if you see the squiggly channels, they're interesting, but again, we, we're more right now focusing on get, getting these blotches. But as I've been talking, I'm pretty sure you found all the images that had fans and blotches in them and the images that were blank. Now try to make a computer do this. And so, so far, um, it took years, the high-rise team failed at doing this. And so using high-rise, right, they had this imagery, but there's 100,000 fans in the image. It's not gonna be something you can mark when you have hundreds of images. Um, and so this was the problem was that, you know, it's very easy to see these features, but because they fade out gradually, it's very hard to make a machine do this. So how do we do this? So for us, we're using the power of the Zooniverse and citizen science and human pattern recognition. So our eyes have been built to do this, right? Our brains and our eyes are easily built to be pattern recognition, or to find pattern recognition, but also to figure out things that don't fit a pattern from hunting and gathering days, right? This is the stuff that we are, our brains automatically do, right? Children can pick out their parents' faces, right? It's still sometimes hard when I can't, you know, flew into Taipei from a trip home in the US, the automatic scanner wouldn't realize that my face was the same as my passport, um, right? But my mother could tell, right? When I was got off the plane in the US the same way, looking a little tired and haggard, knew it was me, right? Our brains are built to do this. And so the idea is that if you actually look at um, statistics for the US, um, about uh, Americans spend about half an hour on Facebook uh, a day, um, at least. So a half an hour a day, um, every day, if you could take a small amount of that brain power and apply it to something else, um, you could get a lot of science out of it. And so the Zooniverse is the largest online platform for citizen science. And so we've partnered with them to solve this fan problem. And so Planet 4, and now in its second version, but this was the original site, was launched to have people look at these fan directions. And so, you know, we had 136,000 people that participated. And so you can go to planet4.space. Um, it's where we have, you know, a couple projects, I think two are live right now and one needs data that you can go look at um, if you get bored my talk um, and don't want to listen, go classify some images instead, go explore Mars. Um, but the idea behind Planet 4 is that we gave you, a, and still, you get a sub uh, image of a full high rise for a uh, full frame image. We give you a, a cutout from it. And we ask you or any volunteer who goes to the site, they see a quick tutorial and they're giving a fan tool, which is basically an ice cream cone um, and a blotch or an ellipse tool. And we ask based on whether you see directionality to draw either a fan or blotch. So draw an ellipse if there doesn't look like to be their direction right, or starting point, like, but if you can see what looks like a starting point, then draw using the fan tool. And so we can take that, and the idea behind citizen science is using the wisdom of crowds. And you might've seen this with game shows, right? When you someone asks the audience, the majority gets the answer right. And so there's been a lot of paper from projects like Galaxy Zoo and Planet Hunters that have been using in the astro in astronomy, been using human pattern recognition in, in bulk, right? And in, in crowdsourced assessments to, um, and to do science. And the idea here is that you can compare to experts. And what tends to happen is that when you combine multiple results from non-experts, so not one, but many, right? Independent assessments from non-experts, you equal or outperform the expert because a lot of the times you take out the variability. So it depends on how much coffee I've had, how long my day was, I might misclassify something. 
But when you have so many people doing it, right, and you've broken down the task, you, you can get uh, much better results um, than uh, with human pattern recognition and crowdsourcing and citizen science. And often there's been shown in from Zooniverse projects that this outperforms the machine learning results as well. And that with this data, you can do really well teaching the machines because you have probabilities, right? I'll give you an example, right? If I look at whether a source is a fan or a blotch, I will just make an assessment and say it's a fan or a blotch. But by having 30 people or more, and for Planet 4, we have about 30 people look at each image, I get an assess, I get a probability, right? I can say whether 90% of the volunteers thought this, the source was a fan or 50% saw that it was a fan or 20%. And so you can put that information into a machine learning algorithm that could even improve it based on having a binary classification, for example. And so how do we go from these individual markings to a catalog and do you even believe it? Because it's great that you have human beings do this, but do you actually believe them, right? Are they accurate? Um, and so what we do is we combine the results together using a clustering algorithm. So we clean up the database, remove any duplicate sources, and then we do a clustering per, um, uh, per fans and blotches. So we take the individual drawing tools and we cluster them individually. And so we use the starting point for fans, we use the center for the blotches, we look over a certain radii, and then um, we also look on angle for fans and blotches. We look at radii and sort of do two different lengths. And I'll show you that in a section, second. Um, and then we look and say, okay, we have a bunch of fan sources and we have a bunch of blotch sources. Um, and as long as at least three people marked those sources, they stay. So as long as there were three sources that somebody marked, right, whether it was a fan or a blotch, they, we think they're the same. If we see at least three people mark it, we think it's a real thing. And so now we have all these fan sources and blotch sources, right? And then we look and see whether those overlap. Because I could have something one per, several people marked as a fan, but everyone else marked as a blotch. And so if it is, then we look at it and make that assessment. And so for our catalog, if at least 50% or more of the volunteers that marked that individual source said it was a fan, we call it a fan. Otherwise, we call it a blotch. And then we do some ground projection to get the latitude and longitude of Mars. Um, and then we output that to our final catalog. So here's how we're actually doing the clustering within sort of the getting the fan. So we're doing that base pixel position. We look within 10 pixels and anything that's within that, we count as being the same. And we also look at, again, at angle. Um, and so it has to be within about 20 degrees. We call that the same thing. And for blotches, we do this within the center pixel within 10 pixels, and then we do a radius cut. And then we notice for very big sort of ellipses, there's more sort of slosh, there's more uncertainty in marking the position. So we have a slightly different cut here. And so we spent a lot of time trying to refine these thresholds to make this catalog. Okay. And so that's great, but let me show you some results to see if you believe me. So this is showing one of those Planet 4 sub-images here. And so here in this image, we're showing all the fan markings. So each color is a different volunteer that marked. And you'll see that not everyone does this task correctly. So this person marched all these together. Here's all the blotch markings. So each color is a different volunteer. And you can see that some people just drew big things and maybe we're testing it out, not engaging. But overall, right, you can see that if you combine the results, most people did the task. And so when you combine the results together, you get the individual fans and blotches here. Okay, so now we've reduced everything to being individual blotches here. So taking this cluster, so now this is clustered and you can see here, these three fans are picked up as a blotch, but they're also picked up in the fan catalog as individual fans. And so again, these are linked and because more people marked these as fans, they get left in the fan catalog. And so you can see here in this final image, this is us plotting all everything that's in our, our final fan and blotch catalog and we are getting most of the sources. Here's a harder image just to give you, uh, or maybe a, a more, um, more surface area covered image to give you an example. And overall, we're finding all the sources. There sometimes will still be some confusion of, if you look here, we got all this, we had all three sources, right? And we see them as a large ellipse that some people mark them all together as one, some mark them individually. So we do have some of those features still in the catalog, but overall, We've gotten all the sources and we've got a lot of fan measurements to start looking in directions. Let me just show you again, maybe a harder image. And so this case, right, the fans are actually in white 
Um, this is more frost, but volunteers still marked them. And so there's information here that we can still use. But again, by having people clustering, again, we're still finding features. Again, just showing another image, it's a little bit harder. And again, it's being reduced down to something here. So we are still grabbing most of the features that look like fans or blotches. Um, and I should say the one caveat in the catalog, again, is that we're looking at individual subframes, so these blue outlines. And what we do to ensure that we get out, we get the over, we get the edges because our images just end is that we have 100 pixels overlap to the next image. And so, except for the edges of the high-rise frame. So these dashed lines are showing where that overlap is. And so just to visually show you here, although we're not worrying about that when we link, we, we do all the clustering from individual cutouts, it's not doing a bad job at finding the sources. So we decided not to go further to try to refine this. So even here, you can see that we identified the sources and that there's always one marking that covers the whole thing. Okay, so that's all fine and dandy, <laughs> but you, you wanna know if this actually works, right? Um, and so what we've done, and I hope that I will convince you by the end of this talk is that this does work. And so what we did is that, um, we took 4% of the data, which was about 200 to 300 images per scientist. And so I'm MES in here, so you can decide whether I'm good at finding fans and blotches or not. But we took the three, three members from the science team and we had us use the classification tool and draw our own markings. And so the dark gray is the catalog, I'm the orange, and overall, um, the catalog and the experts match. And in some cases that you see the catalog over, it gets more sources. But as we get to bigger sources, 30, 40, 50, 60 pixels, there are not that many of them. And you'll see that although there's higher here, it's because it's picking up some sources here where I might've marked bigger than the volunteers. But overall, what we're seeing is that the variation between the researchers is the same as the variation with the catalog. And so overall, and here I'm just showing the number of tiles, so the number of these sub subframes from high rise versus the number of fans and blotches per planet per tile. So overall, we're getting the same distribution. We think there's a, a, as many sources in the images as fans and blotches as the catalog. And the variation between the researchers is the same as compared to the catalog. So if I had not told you that the dark gray was a catalog, you wouldn't have identified it as being any different than an expert. And we can do this along different axes. So this is just showing for the fan catalog, fan catalog the number of fans per planet four uh, tile. Um, and so again, the idea that overall we're getting the same numbers, or at least it matches one of the scientists. Um, and so these are uh, data where we've all looked at the same image. Um, and so again, we disagree with each other, just you can see the differences here. But again, overall, our differences are pretty much are match well, roughly well with the catalog. And so the idea of being here to say is, it's not just that everyone, we match the same, we, we at least identified the fans and blotches, we are at least matching them the same in the type of marking we would have used and the size and length. And here's just showing the same thing for blotches. So you can see here, um, at some point, I don't, I mark way more blotches bigger than other people. And these are, we're all marking the same images. So again, the idea being that the variation in the catalog is the same as the variation between the individual researchers. We can do this versus fan length um, versus, uh, again, um, the number of fans looking at a set of images. So to expand further, um, I, we had each of the three researchers look at a different set of images. So we had our common set and then we looked at about 200 to 300 images that were different. And the idea being is that we could drill down into the number of fans and see if there was any difference in terms of length or other things that just beyond that, um, the same common core that we did. Because now we know that we're roughly consistent with each other, we can look at this. And you can see with the catalog, we're doing pretty well. But again, the variation that you saw between the individual researchers is about the same as we see here. So we think this is evidence the catalog is doing really well. And another way to look at this is looking at the wind direction. And so this is just showing the delta wind direction. So taking the average of an individual subframe from high rise that I marked or of my two collaborators marked, Right, and then comparing that to the average wind direction or the average um, fan direction that came from just the catalog. And so here you can see the, the difference and overall we have most things sitting at zero, but again, and this has been is here the number of, of planet four tiles um, in terms of uh, looking at the uh, full high rise frames rather. And so what you can see here is that overall we're ranging within um, 
being consistent. And so it's within about 10 degrees in most cases is the wind direction. Um, and so, you know, or the fan direction. And so we think that means that we're doing well on identifying sources, what kind they are, where they're pointed and their shapes and lengths, which means we can finally do the science um, that we've been wanting to do with this data set. And so hopefully I've convinced you that this is an interesting data set and an, a valid data set to start comparing and looking at the seasonal processes on Mars. So what was the old end goal of this was to start looking at wind directions. And just to show you this, this is a rose diagram. So we're showing you again um, from uh, the direction from North Asthma. So we've sort of aligned the image to way it, where the image is sort of would be aligned with the pole or rather it would be angled. Um, so it's not necessarily, so zero is down, but you can see here that the wind fans are all pointing this way. Um, that's opposite of wind direction. So this is the way the wind traveled, not necessarily the wind direction. Um, it's always a reverse of that. But the idea being is you can point and say the wind was moving from here to that direction, or at least we think it does. Um, and here, I like the rose diagram, but we're also showing it here in, in a, a flat diagram to help as well. Um, and the point being is these are just the individual number of fans. So overall, there's 120, right, or more fans in this image that were used, like 300 that were used in this in this uh, in full high raise frame to get you this. So we're just showing a sub image, but again, you can sort of believe that all these fans are going from left to right on this angle, from corner from the bottom corner to the top corner, right, no, left corner and the bottom right, and that's again consistent with what we're seeing. So we think again that all of this is telling us we've got a catalog we can start growing with. Okay, so what are the numbers? So we looked at two Mars years with the data. So we put, um, it's called season two and season three of the high rise campaign. So you're like, that's two, where's one? So season one was when high rise arrived, um, when Mars Reconstruct arrived at Mars and they targeted differently because they were figuring out how to target and they're figuring out where to look on the South Pole. So we start with season two and season three of the high rise monitoring campaign because those have pretty consistent pointings. And so those are Mars years 29 and 30. They count back from the 70s. Uh, they count from the 70s of when they first sent spacecraft to Mars. So that's why the years are so young. Um, and so we have about 160,000 fan measurements on the South Pole of Mars. So we have the largest wind map ever created for the surface of another world. Um, and we have 250,000 roughly blotches identified. And so the volunteers looked through 42,000, roughly 43,000 tiles. And that comes into about, or sub high rise sub images. And that totals 221 high rise, individual high rise observations over two Martian years, covering 28 different regions or pointings on the South Pole. So now we've gone to, to you know, data rich from being data poor. Um, and so here is just showing those individual sort of regions on the South Par Pole where we have these observations and wind proxies for wind directions. And so, so just to show you this in terms of time, so L sub S is uh, Mars's uh, location in its orbit. And so you can use this um, again as a proxy for time or season. So we're starting off in the spring, the Southern, southern spring here. And so again, we're showing latitude versus this L sub S. This is again um, in Mars year uh, season three, there was a safe mode event for Mars reconnaissance orbiter. So we have a gap in data because um, the spacecraft wasn't responding. Um, but as much as the spacecraft is responding, we have data both temporarily in terms of time and latitude. So I think this is a really nice data set for us to start looking at. Okay, so what are some of the next steps? Well, one of the things we wanna do is look at areas um, and really look at how much uh, has the albedo or the changes in the surface, um, surface, the top of this ice sheet has changed because it might mean when you're covered with a fan that you sublimate more because you're darker and absorbing more sunlight. So maybe you're heating the ice. So that's one of the things we wanna do is start looking at actual total area covered. And so merge these individual markings. And here's just an example. Um, here's the individual markings and then this marking code in light blue that might be hard to see that we've started developing to sort of merge the individual sort of um, features when we have overlap. So the idea is that one of the next steps is to look at that area we've covered. But what we started to do is look at how wind directions have changed on the South Pole and how has it changed over different parts of it. So I wanna walk through a little bit of that um, and get into some of the machine learning things that we've done as well. 
Okay, so here, um, this is showing one region we've dubbed Manhattan. Okay, and each color is a different observation from high rise at a different um, Elsa Bess or time and season from uh, the start of uh, Southern spring. So bigger numbers mean further into the spring and, and start of summer. And on the top here, we have Manhattan, Mars year 29. So this is the season two of the high rise monitoring campaign and this is season three. And already we've got some interesting results. So, okay, we look here and we see this pink is, so beginning of the season 183 Elsa so early spring, we see the wind are directed pretty much at 225. And same thing, these rose diagrams are looking at fan direction clockwise from north azimuth direction, okay. So again, this is just really from, from pointing that north, where north would be, and we're looking at our directions, where our wind, where spins are going. And we've just sort of shifted this. So if you put the image underneath it from how it looks, um, you would be able to see it would follow these directions. So that's why I don't have zero up at the top. But these are all aligned the same, so we're all in good state. And so what you see here is that if you look at between Mars year 29 and 30, so the colors are very similar. The, they took an observation 182.8 Elsabes in the second year, and in the first year was 183.1. They're pretty much on top of each other. And they're pointed in a similar direction. And then we see that as we progress in the season, right, the wind direction has changed. And the reason I wanna say it's changed is that if these fans were still around here, we'd still have a spike in this direction. And so it, it really is also looking like those fans disappear and we think maybe sinking into the ice. And same thing here, we see a very similar history and that we have some observations in the middle that get us here, or in this time we didn't, um, and that again, we're seeing a switch from 225 to 270. And same thing, this over here is early spring. Here we're looking in the right at late spring, early summer. Um, and again, you see that switch that we stay over on this side of the, the right-hand side of the plot. And so then the fans continue. And so I think we really are starting to can argue these fans are definitely seeing the wind direction, right? They definitely are, are indi indicating that and that the wind directions have changed. Um, and so by having these hundreds and thousands of fans, we're starting to be able to tease this out. And that different parts of the South Pole have different behaviors. So this is just showing you Inca City. It's another one of the regions. Um, and you sort of see that in that, if you look just between early spring and late spring, you can just see that they were all sort of pointing roughly in one quadrant, but then it goes everywhere in late spring, right? It's like every pointing, you have things on this side and this side and this side and this side. Um, and that makes sense because we, when we actually look at the region, there's all these polygonal ridges. Um, and so we think you're seeing is all these different slopes, um, you know, with these fans also pointed in these different directions due to the slopes being in multiple different locations and directions. And so topography is gonna matter with this, but um, for most of the areas, we think that, you know, we really are able to tease out difference that are not necessarily due to, Strong, as strong features as we see in, in Inca. And I just wanna walk through Giza, one of these other areas, and you notice we've used Earth cities as names um, for informal names for all these locations we have images for. Okay, so here's Giza. And so we're seeing, again, we have this point direction here between 270 and 315, and that we keep moving, and now it's moving from three, a little bit past 315. We've now passed zero. Again, as we're continuing in spring and going into late spring into summer, and we see that we've got sort of a range here, but again, we're still sort of close to zero. Um, and so we have all these different directions that we're seeing, um, and we can actually look at this um, and estimate wind speeds and look at fan direction. Um, and so this is what we started doing. Anya Portagana has actually submitted his paper. It's no longer in prep, it's actually submitted. And so estimating using an estimated particle size um, for the fans and thinking about how far you could, could move that in just free fall. Um, we can proxy the, the fan length to a wind speed um, and look at the most probable direction. So take all these fans, right? We have this distribution and look at where the most probable direction is. So what's the rough wind speed? And this is all, you know, this color is one high rise image. So these are showing you the individual directions of the, the, the fans in these images. So we can take all of this and fit for that most probable um, direction. And that's what's generating these plots. And the error bar is that sort of variation. Um, we're taking it as a variation um, 
within the measurement. So again, looking at what's the spread of wind speeds or looking at the spread of angles um, or directions that are coming from the, the histogram I just showed. So again, you can sort of see that there's a peak in that fan directions are, are definitely changing as we go from, from L sub S in time, but also that we see wind speed is changing too. And that therefore, again, we're seeing that the fans had to also change. And so their lengths changed. So we're still investigating the fan lengths. But what I can show you about wind speeds and the thing that we always wanted to do was again, looking at um, and comparing to global climate models. And so this is what we've just been able to do. And so what I'm showing you here is the wind directions um, and you can really just look at the top plot, but this is comparing to a global climate model of Mars. So we've thrown in all the physics that we know about the climate and the atmosphere and the sublimation process and compared the wind directions um, and the speeds to what we're getting from planet four. So each red solid line is telling you the direction or the most probable direction from a planet four image. And the dash line is telling you what our, our speed we estimated. And so the color of the dots, it tells you roughly when the, the color is telling you of these little dots, tells you about the, the amount of sunlight, um, the, the norm of the, the insulation. So, so again, how much sunlight was coming. Um, that was driving that specific wind. But the idea is that these little dots are telling you the wind, individual wind directions at each step in this model in this time frame. So in this time step that we took the high rise image. And so what you see is we see that we're seeing at least a wind direction and speed that matches our observations. They're not wildly different from each other, which is not what I expected. Um, and then the bottom just showing you, you know, um, time of day and the wind, direc uh, wind direction, just to make sure that when the sun was up, when you should be getting these fans, that the wind, the wind direction happens. And as you can see in these images, the so dark red is telling you, or the dark black is telling you our, our wind direction. And so at least at some point when the sun is above the horizon, there's a wind direction and a speed that matches our observation. So this is the first time we've ever compared to a, a model, a climate model. And I think we're really able to say that in broad strokes, these climate models are not doing a bad job of estimating the surface winds. And I think with all of this evidence, we're really showing that one, these features are, done, are being mapped by the winds and that we've created this global map of wind directions that we've now been able to show that our base level of physics for Mars is good enough, but low resolution topography is able to explain this. And the topography in the high-rise images, right, is we can see a coffee table on the surface of Mars. And the models that are being used to generate wind directions don't have that precision. And so we can already say that some of the local topography, right, doesn't matter. It's the big global scale topography in South Pole and larger regions that are matter, right? That, ha you know, centimeter, meter scale features are not driving the winds. And, and get, but we do know that there is some context and we are seeing some things with, with you know, topography overall, right? And the big topography matters. And so here's just showing you that in the sense that there's this chasm in here. Um, and the, this is just showing you topography and height. And so here we're seeing sort of the edges of what we would call the polar layer deposits or a bunch of layers of water and ice on the surface uh, of the South Pole where then the, the temporary ice cap, that seasonal ice cap is on top of. And you see our wind direction sort of straddle this <laughs> chasm. It kind of, we're all pointed going, uh, you know, away or, or, you know, away from sort of this, this high here as we go sort of these things sort of swing down into the depression and sort of these go over the rest of the, the higher ladder, the higher elevations. And so again, I think we're seeing that these bigger features matter more than what are the specific features in the high rise images. Um, in terms of the wind and its interaction. Um, and then the other cool thing I think is that, and one thing that wasn't expected for us is that we actually see that the winds, be, the winds bifurcate. So this is one region, it's called, we've dubbed it Mackel's Field. And you see it, and we're showing here histograms of the fan, uh, the, num the number of fans in their direction. So again, that same, at, you know, angle from counterclockwise from zero atomists, and then we're showing the fan lengths here um, in meters um, and it just, you know, again, a histogram, so the number in a high rise image of snapshot. And what you can see is that as we get into later L sub S's, so here's early spring and as we go down, we start seeing two dominant wind directions. 
and we didn't we didn't tell the model to do this but here's late spring early summer and there's two wind directions might not do so well here but it can produce it and so i think we really are seeing that we are now have a good at least i think an understanding of at least some of the interactions that are happening on the surface of Mars and its wind directions. And so it's really nice that one of the things we've always wanted to do is start comparing in these ways. And now we can say, okay, great. How long do these wind directions stay around? Is it five Mars years? Do they stay the same? And how do these change as we pump in more dust into the Martian atmosphere, right? With those global dust storms and how do they change the way that carbon dioxide returns back to the atmosphere? Okay, that's great. We've done this. It took us several years to get to this point. Um, I just want to end a little bit by thinking about how do we do this with neural networks. And so what about convolutional neural networks and machine learning? Okay, so here we have um, uh, a Planet 4 image and it's got our beautiful bifurcating fans. And here's the Planet 4 catalog. Well, what is this? So we've been working with uh, collaborators in Australia to use a neural net, uh, convolutional neural net, a machine learning algorithm taking all of our individual fan measurements because we have so many now, right? We now have a catalog where before we never had one to even try really getting machine learning to work correctly. And so this is the results from this machine learning uh, uh, network. And so you'll notice these are not fan shapes. Um, and so the issue here is that the, the network sucks at identifying whether something is a fan or a blotch. They can't figure out how to do this. It's a hard problem. So we have not put the human beings out of our collaborators out of a job yet. But what it can do is identify the pic individual pixels and whether they're in, um, in a, a fan or a blotch. And so we've also tried other clustering algorithms that are similar to machine CNN machine learning algorithms and they fail. So they pick up topography. So you'll see in this image, that they're just tuning the parameter slightly differently and the colors are saying are, are being picked up as fans. And so basically you see is if it tries to, uh, what it thinks is a fan. And you see here, the fans are here or blushes are here and here and the rest is spiders, RNA form these channels. Um, and that this algorithm, you really have to tune to get just this feature. And that even if you do, it changes when you go to a different area and texture on Mars. And so still the human beings are beating out the machine but the machines might help us a little bit with the CNN at least doing better um, and being able to identify the pixels compared to this sort of other clustering algorithm, this ISO data algorithm that's sometimes employed um, when in machine learning situations. Okay, so I just wanna end just show that um, looking at some of the things people look at with machine learning, which is recall and precision. And it, you can think of precision as basically the number of things that you got Right, right, you identified correctly divided by your false positives and your true positives, your, your true real things. And recall, which is our, our y axis here. So, and recall is how much of the stuff that was right did you get over both your true positives, the stuff that was right, and the stuff that you said that wasn't right, that was real. Um, so, again, it's sort of the true positives plus your true negatives, or sorry, your false negatives, right? So, it's your true identifications plus your false negatives. So from reality, right, what fraction did you get right over the actual things that are real? And you want these both to be high. Um, and so that clustering algorithm, that ISO data is sort of here in green and the CNN is um, this blue. And you see overall um, the blue, you know, the blue is doing much better. Um, overall, it's tending in this direction. Um, and the bigger the circles, again, showing other, um, again, it's just showing the better the match and the individual tiles. And so this is just showing again that definition of recall and precision. So um, thinking about it with the shape like this where the actual marking and the machine learning, um, just to give you a sense. But you can think of it again as, as you wanna get both of these, the stuff that you get, you find the everything, but you also um, identify it correctly, right? You, you wanna get as the right number of pixels and you also wanna identify the right number of sources. Um, and so that's what we're, we're looking at right now. Um, and so we now have a machine learning algorithm that can at least identify fans and blotches, but it's not good enough. And pixels, right? And so this is a, block, a, fan, a pixel that's in a fan or blotch, but it can't do directions. So we launched Planet 4 2.0. Um, we launched it in March. And so we are using that as our, um, our new um, website. It's new and improved on the latest algorithm. And we're using that to continue the search. 
looking for these seasonal plan, uh, fans and watches because we have so much more data and can now, now that we actually know that this is really looking at, really showing us wind directions, look at how the other sort of parts of the Martian climate and how it very impact this process. And so I'll just say that, um, you know, we've been really able to um, use this algorithm and use this method to really be able to study um, the rest of, of Mars. Um, and, you know, I think there's lots of things that we can do and, you know, other things that we've done with this data set has been to um, use citizen science and spawn these other citizen science projects from knowing the success of Planet 4. And I just want to highlight that in that one of the things we did was we actually said, great, we have all these locations where we see these spiders and fans, uh, or rather see these seasonal fans. Are there other areas that we could be looking at that are not the ones we that were originally set by the high rise team that might be interesting to explore the wind directions? And so we actually had people, volunteers using the Planet for Terrain site, um, which is right now paused. We're we'll going to upload some data over the next week. But the idea of that site is to look for those wiggly channels um, the spiders, those RNA forms that are produced, as you can see here, these channels that are produced by this carbon dioxide jet process. And so we've actually had found lots more sites um, where when we see these spiders, we know that there's got to probably be these, these carbon dioxide jets going off in the spring. And so this is just showing you a high resolution of one of the areas that our volunteers are identified. And so Planet 4 has spawned this new project called Planet 4 Terrains that has identified new regions where there are carbon dioxide jets that we're now gonna feed those high resolution images that have been targeted back into planet four to get wind measurements of new areas of the Martian South Pole to get, expand the wind map. And so I'll end there and, and put up our observations. And so planet for terrains has gotten us a lot of these new sites. Um, we've got, we've been comparing to climate models. And so I think for the first time you can really say we've generated the largest wind map, you know, with people on earth exploring Mars from their sofa. And so with that, I'll take any questions. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks, Megan. Um, any, any questions? Uh, Jane? Uh, hi, um, that was a, a nice talk. I've actually used this planet for um, Zooniverse thing at um, an open day. And I was wondering what the efficiency of the, the citizen science measurements is, because although I took it seriously and measured things uh, in a serious way, the um, five to 10 people who were interested in it just put random measurements on. So I'm wondering what fraction of the data is actually sort of um, useful? Yeah, so let me give you an example here, right? All of it. Um, so the idea is it's the power of the crowd, right? And so we really are going back and let's see if I can drag it, right? There will always be people, uh, this is a good example. This person clearly didn't do the task right, but it's the, it's the majority. And so it's not using an individual person. So even if those five people didn't engage, it's the fact that we get 30 measurements. And so something about asking people to do science means they care. Um, and so because of that, they, they, most people go to these sites, at least from the statistics and surveys, is to contribute to science. It's not to look at pretty pictures, um, interestingly. And so, yeah, it's okay if a few people mess it up. It's okay occasionally. I mean, I try really hard not to put, you know, random markings of them testing something, but because the clustering algorithm will identify it, it's going to take the majority answer. And so we've shown it works by by looking at it and comparing to, to the, our expert data. But yeah, overall, we don't see a problem because we're combining classifications from multiple volunteers. So, um, so most of so your yeah, volunteers- So it's totally okay are, to do it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So, so you think that most of your, do you have profiles on the sort of volunteers you have? Are most of them sort of, they revisit the site? So we have two types actually. So like the internet, most people go and leave and do a few and never come back. Um, and so we have we have to balance the site for two different types of people. So about something like 20% of the total volunteer population will look at 50 to 60% of the images total, but then the rest of that is coming from people that come and do a few. So we have to make the site both accessible for people that come back all the time and for people that are, are new because 
it, as the nature of the internet, we all, our attention is fastly diverted, right? So people will come do a few and never come back. But if you have press conference, you know, press releases and blog posts and newsletters, email newsletters are the best way to get people back by reminding them that there's projects they come. Um, and also being on the platform, they remember that they class, people that remember they classified another project. So like weirdly, if Galaxy Zoo is busy, Planet 4 will be busy. Um, and so there's that nice thing about being on the platform that people remember and then we'll go investigate. So if there's a press release from one of the other projects, it folds down into many of the other ones. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Can I ask a question? Oh, sure, a couple. Uh, thanks, Mike. It was an amazing talk. Um, I have a few uh, questions on the this uh, jets or fountains, CEO fountains. How big they are? Their height over the ground level. <laughs> ah, you noticed I went quickly by that. We don't know because <laughs> we've never seen them. So, so we don't even know when they go off. It's sad. Um, so that's a problem when you have like one spacecraft that is high resolution. Um, so they've been trying to schedule like different observations at different times and then move the spacecraft off NADAR to try to get um, stereo imagery. They had never seen the fans. Um, so we've never seen like, we should see a shadow if we actually saw the material coming up and like falling down. They don't see that in stereo imaging. So it could be, we've just got really poor timing and that the fans go off at some time, right? Maybe it's early morning when there's not enough light or they're pretty low. So one estimate is if they are low, they're no more than two stories. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And another but question we've is- we've never like, caught them live. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what about, um, so I, I guess there's a CO cycle or uh, can you, like it comes down as rain or how, how it, it happens? In, in... We don't fully know. <laughs> so some of it comes Sorry. out carbon dioxide. <laughs> <laughs> no, so it's, that's the cool thing. We don't 100% know. We know that there's some carbon dioxide snow. We don't know if it fully comes down or snow, but it can also just, it can, it can just freeze, right? It can go straight from the atmosphere to freezing it down, right? Um, and so both of those are happening. How much is one versus the other is not clear because um, the whole pole is in darkness, right? So we don't get any observations from it and it's really hard to target a spacecraft mm -hmm. <laughs> that way. So, so we, it's a combination of, of carbon dioxide, snow, and then just straight freezing out um, from gas to solid. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, I think I, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about the, um, um, about this uh, CNN uh, algorithm. I, I'm trying to do similar things, but for galaxies, not, not. So uh, like if you have some of the technical details, like how many, how many layers or how many neurons or uh, like. I, I have the paper and can pull them out. Um, I know, I think it's, I believe it's, um, I think it's at least two, um, but Beyond that, I'd have to go look at the paper drafts um, right now. Um, it's it's more, yeah, it, it, it can do a pretty good job at identifying the, the individual pixels, but it's, it's doing poorly at direction and shape. Um, and the understanding I have from that is that um, like it's just not enough data. And so it can, it can identify some, but that it royally screws up in other ways that are just, not, we don't know how to train. Um, and so it could be a training problem, but like, you know, um, an example is that currently the, the our machine learning expert was like, I got the directions to work and we're like, great. And he goes, they're accurate to plus or minus 30 degrees. And we're like, that's not accurate. Um, and so we're, we're fighting an accuracy in machine learning where they're like, problem solved versus us. We're like, we can do better than 30 degrees with our way. Um, so it's still it's still a work in progress. I can um, I can take a look at the paper, but um, I don't have full details in my head about the CNN. Okay, but it's yeah. one of the basic it's one of the basic ones that's around. My the you know my, our machine learning collaborators say it's one of the more advanced ones, but you know that's what he says. Um, but I can go look up and and see the exact. I think it's something called U-turn. Maybe I'll take a look at the name for you and see if that's helpful. Okay, yeah, that's, that's fine. I can I can look at the paper and um, and then my other question. Although you you partly answered it already, is I, I was wondering if, if you would reach a point where uh, there will be so much data that even citizen citizen science would not be enough. But I think you have the opposite problem, right? There's not enough data to train the uh, the machine learning uh, algorithm. Right? 
Yeah, right now. I mean, we're, we're already data, we're in the problem, we don't have enough people, right? So it took us three years to classify the data we have, um, right? And so <laughs> like that's, you know, we, we'd love to get more human CPUs, but again, right, so we would, you know, so there is that problem of like, we're waiting years to get all these observations. At least we now have a data set, which is great. Um, ideally, if it, you know, we can put human, if we can put the human collaborators out of business, then we do. Um, then we'd close up shop. Um, but I think is right now, the fact that we can't get directionality better than 30 degrees. Um, and that's in the best case scenario right now means that Planet 4 is not out of business anytime soon. But what we can start doing um, is merging the two. And so there's a lot of, if you haven't read it, there's a lot of work by Chris Lintot's group in Oxford um, about um, combining the two for Galaxy Zoo um, and that they actually do better by having both together um, and so our thinking is to apply this, but in a slightly different way is that we don't even know what images are blank. We do have blank images where there are no fans. So why are we having 30 people look at them if they're empty now? But one of the problems is not, not every volunteer draws on the images. I kind of made it sound like that, but a lot of the images, you will have a, 20, a significant number of volunteers that don't engage in the task. You know, if there's a hundred fans in the image, a lot of people go, no, um, <laughs> go on to the next one. So we don't, in an individual image, we can't say that when someone doesn't mark that that means there's no fans in the image. We have to analyze the whole thing first. But the CNN is doing really well at identifying whether there's pixel, fan pic or blotch pixels in the image. And so our thinking is to merge the two and have the machine, the CNN run on it and also ask like a percentage of the volunteers whether there's fans or blotches in the image. And if both agree, we pull it and we say, okay, we don't have to have the volunteers look at it. And so we could hopefully speed up the process by not having 30 people look at a blank image. But there's a caveat is that um, they did this for a um, snapshot Serengeti where it's looking at animal traps and characterizing the animals. So they pulled out all the grass images because they had a CNN that could do that um, or an a machine learning algorithm that could do it. And people were like, I want to I want to have the surprise of seeing an animal. So even though you could speed up the process and you could see an animal every image, people left sooner and, and classified more when they had a few images of just grass, you know, or a tree blowing in the wind. So we'll have to balance that and see if, if having all images that have fans in it or blotches in it de deters people. So there's a balance of human psychology with the machine learning um, and the straight citizen science. Okay, thanks, uh, very in interesting. Um, any other questions? I have another, just a curious question. Do you know that the ages of the people who participate? Like, do you, can you do that statistics? <laughs> uh, other people do. Um, I don't think I have them specifically for Planet Four. It's been done for. I was involved in. The, I was involved in the Planet Hunters project. They did it for that, and they did it for Galaxy Zoo. Um, and so, interestingly, it's pretty flat. So, yes, you have a lot of retirees. Um, but up to like, I think it's 15, you, or you can survey people in the UK. Um, and so they've done from like 15 and up. And so it's pretty flat. So you have people of all different ages. Um, we know we have people from Vietnam um, all the way <laughs> to almost everywhere in, in the world that have classified, even though the interface is really mostly in English. We have a couple other translations like uh, traditional character uh, Chinese originally. Um, um, and in the original version. And so, uh, yeah, there's, um, it's pretty flat. Uh, our super users tend to be adults. So these people that try to go further and do lots of images and are more active in the discussion tool tend to be adults. Um, but yeah, it's a wide range. It depends on the project. So I think uh, on the animal trap ones, it's a lot of parents with kids. And so um, you'll see that in the discussion tool, or at least some of the surveys have shown that, that it's like, I'm here with my four-year-old and we're looking at whether that's a bobcat versus a monkey um, versus a zebra, you know. Um, but yeah, uh, so so it's pretty pretty even and that it's again, more male than female, but is a significant number of, of women and gender minorities that are classifying as well. Nice, thanks. Okay, uh, so, um, if there are no more questions, uh, I think we should uh, thank Megan again uh, for a great talk. Um, thank you. Thanks.